gracias. Bueno, vamos a tener dos charlas y en el medio vamos a tener una encuesta con una pregunta con la intención de ganarse una beca para Mar del Plata, para el Congreso de Mar del Plata de este año, el que la contesta bien gana una beca. Así que bueno, vamos a arrancar que estamos medio atrasados. Voy a presentar a alguien al cual le tengo mucho aprecio, que es el doctor Fernando Prieu, que es amigo de la casa. Eh, el doctor es médico de SEMAFE, de OER y de IWISHIS. Y nos va a hablar de introducción en la cirugía endoscópica de oído. Fer, te doy el mando. Bueno, hola, ¿qué tal? Buenas tardes a, a todos. Mientras tanto voy viendo para compartir pantalla. A ver. ¿Podés? Sí, ahí vamos. A ver ahí. ¿Ven ahí? ¿Se ve bien? Sí. Perfecto, Perfecto. Fer. Bueno. Bueno, antes que nada, muy, muy, muy agradecido por la invitación. Eh, vamos a ver principios en cirugía endoscópica de oído. Esto va a ser un mero repaso de lo que ya venimos diciendo hace mucho tiempo y de lo que, si por ahí tuvieron la posibilidad de, de ver algunos webinars, que gracias a Dios hay muchos, eh, de, de, esta, de esta temática, eh, va, van a ver que vamos a, a repetir varias, varias cuestiones. Eh, bueno, para que no me conocen, yo soy Fernando Prieto, soy de Santa Fe. Eh, participo activamente con compañeros, el doctor Reyes, de Stipech y a Efeli de Otología Endoscópica de Oído. Si hablamos de principios, tenemos que remitirnos a la bibliografía. La bibliografía, la, la Biblia, por así decirlo, eh, de la cirugía endoscópica de oído es eh, el libro del doctor Presutti y Marchioni. Está todo lo que hay que saber, incluso un poco más. ¿eh? Eh, nosotros con el grupo hemos hecho un, un atlas eh, y una guía de disección que la pueden bajar de nuestra página. Eh, quizá le puede eh, servir, sobre todo para los que tienen eh, ganas de, de iniciar. ¿Mm? Bueno, a modo de introducción hay que hablar un poco de la historia. La verdad que esto no es nuevo. Ya en años eh, 85, 86, 87 había, o, o uno si busca, hay publicaciones que ya mencionan la, la óptica en el oído. ¿Eh? De todas formas, ¿por qué no tuvo auge en esa época? Básicamente porque los sistemas de videos no eran eh, de tan buena calidad, no ofrecían buena calidad, entonces de alguna forma se desestimaba. En el año 92, 93, tanto el doctor Tomasini como Taravici empiezan a publicar algunos trabajos que referían a lo que es el uso de la óptica en el acto quirúrgico para el colestatoma y comparaban la... Eh, la, los, digamos, los resultados quirúrgicos con técnica de mastoectomía canal wall up eh, y la óptica. Cerca del año 97-98 ya el doctor Taravich empieza a, 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 a publicar trabajos no solamente cirugía endoscópica para el colestatoma, sino para timpanoplastia, estapectomía, osiculoplastia y demás. Con lo cual él se lo considera por lo menos en esta etapa eh, más contemporánea como el padre si se quiere, de la cirugía endoscópica de Bueno, la diferencia con el microscopio ya la sabemos, es decir, la óptica del endoscopio sortea de alguna forma el canal más estrecho, el segmento más estrecho del conducto auditivo externo y otorga una visualización muchísimo más amplia sin necesidad de resección de partes blandas con respecto al microscopio. ¿eh? Eh, esa es la diferencia eh, sustancial y esto se ve en los trabajos que comparan justamente la visualización, hay muchos trabajos con eh, reconstrucción 3D y demás, pero nosotros lo podemos ver en los resultados cuando nosotros hacemos una disección o cuando nosotros operamos a un paciente. Estas son imágenes de nuestra guía de disección. La verdad que la óptica lo que ha otorgado es la redefinición quizá de eh, aspectos anatómicos en el oído que quizá antes no, no reparábamos, eh, incluso variantes anatómicas, eh, como el, el finículo, el pontículo, subículo, en fin, lo, la, las diferentes orientaciones del, del, del tensor fold, infinidad de, de cuestiones anatómicas que quizá antes no, no reparábamos en, en detalle, incluso por antrostomía, si nosotros colocamos una óptica podemos llegar a ver 
eh, a ese nivel la relación de la cadena circular con los diferentes ligamentos. ¿sí? No, no sé si se ve mi cursor, pero en la porción más superior de, de las cuatro imágenes puede ver el ligamento incubo malelar lateral. ¿sí? Y esto se ve, decíamos, traducido, es decir, del lado izquierdo podemos ver una visualización de una estapectomía con el microscopio y del lado derecho con el endoscopio. Independientemente de la calidad de imagen, ¿no es cierto? La visualización, esa, esa capacidad de, de visualizar a la vuelta de la esquina, como se le dice, de la óptica, eh, lo diferencia. Entonces, de un inicio eh, se estipuló cuatro técnicas, en primera instancia cirugía microscópica de oído, que quizá eh, es con la que todos comenzamos a, a, a aprender, la cirugía endoscópica eh, de oído, la cirugía microscópica asistida por endoscopio, eh, que quizá a mi criterio es la mejor forma de, de iniciar con el endoscopio, y la cirugía endoscópica asistida por microscopio, que a mi criterio es la mejor opción para abordar una patología de oído medio. Eh. ¿Qué pasa más contemporáneamente? Es decir, más cerca de esta época, bueno, se estipulan clasificación y sobre todo validación de lo que es una cirugía endoscópica transcanal ¿sí? y lo que no es. Y dentro de esta última podemos observar la clase cero, es decir, completamente con el microscopio y variantes como técnica con endoscopio y solamente utilización de microscopio para mastoectomía. ¿sí? Ahora bien, ¿cuál es...? o cuáles son las ventajas con respecto a la morbilidad o comorbilidad para el paciente. Es decir, nosotros vemos mejor, entonces neces eh, no necesitamos abordar eh, partes blandas, con lo cual quizá el tiempo quirúrgico para nosotros, no al principio, que no estamos acostumbrados, pero una vez que ya tenemos mayor práctica, se ve reducido al mismo tiempo quirúrgico. Esto se traduce en menores cicatrices, en eh, eh, digamos, abordajes menos invasivos, eh, menor dolor postoperatorio, menor vendaje compresivo y quizá menor tiempo de internación del mismo paciente. Con respecto a los endoscopios, hay que decir que la mejor opción es la óptica de 30 grados de angulación, 3 milímetros de diámetro y un largo de 14 centímetros. ¿eh? Uno puede operar con una de 0 grados, pero ya vamos a ver que con la de 0 grados no vamos a ver cosas que sí logramos observar con la de 30 grados. ¿El diámetro es importante? Sí, es importante. Con una óptica rinosinusal podemos trabajar, sí podemos trabajar, pero fíjense que, y esto ya está estudiado, la gran mayoría, ¿eh? casi la mitad de los pacientes, no vamos a poder abordar con una óptica de 4 milímetros, sobre todo cuando hablamos de pacientes pediátricos. Entonces, en una relación costo-beneficio, quizá la óptica de 3 milímetros es la que más, eh, más uso le vamos a dar eh, con todos los pacientes. Cámaras, hay que decir que, a ver, el mercado nos ofrece eh, calidad de imagen HD, calidad de imagen 4K, en fin. Eso quizá no es tan importante para nosotros. Lo más importante es la, eh, el punto clave que es la, la utilización de los chips. Es decir, una cámara de tres chips va a ser más importante que la calidad de imagen. La cámara de tres chips otorga eh, mejor, es decir, evita algo que se llama fenómeno de red out, que se ve en sistemas de video de un chip. Izquierda, sistema de video de un chip. Derecha, sistema de video de tres chips. ¿eh? Fíjense la diferenciación. ¿Cuál es la, la importancia? Bueno, es, eh, cuando nosotros tenemos un sistema de video de un chip, el color rojo satura. ¿eh? Entonces tenemos este fenómeno, lo cual puede ser muy frustrante para cuando eh, iniciamos porque no podemos ver. El instrumental hay que decir que cualquier caja autológica nos puede ayudar en primera instancia para hacer eh, resolución de, de, de patología, una perforación, eh, una perla de colistatoma, colocación de tubos. Ahora, a medida que nosotros evolucionamos eh, en, en nuestra manualidad es y sobre todo cuando necesitemos resolver paratología colistatomatosa de oído medio, vamos a necesitar adquirir instrumental angulado adecuado. Con respecto al posicionamiento, ahora vamos a ver cuáles son las opciones que, que se ofrecen, pero lo más importante es que el, el, digamos, el, el campo visual esté a la altura de nuestro monitor. Eso es súper importante, y nosotros como médicos la verdad que no le damos mucha importancia 
a lo que se llaman los trastornos musculoesqueléticos relacionados con el trabajo. Fíjense que la gran mayoría, esto, la gran mayoría perdón, esto es una, una revisión, eh, lo que es la, la paroscopía convencional, que es lo más cercano a lo nuestro, oscila entre el 73 y el 100% eh, de estos trastornos. Y los factores relacionados con esto son, en primera instancia, el posicionamiento de la mesa con el monitor, el instrumento de eje largo, como puede ser la óptica, y el mal diseño del mango instrumental. Eh, y sobre todo, que a ver, no resta importancia, sino que eh, 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 lo aumenta, es que todos estos trastornos muchas veces no se, no se denuncian, no se informan. Esta es un, una imagen del doctor eh, Wam, que siempre el doctor Noveira la, la, la muestra, Esas son las opciones que podemos tener, independientemente de lo que es eh, el posicionamiento nuestro, es decir, si estamos parados o sentados, todo va a depender de la zona de trabajo que nosotros queramos abarcar. Entonces, si nosotros estamos sentados, vamos a tener mejor posicionamiento para lo que es protímpano. Si nosotros estamos parados, a lo que es retrotímpano. Y si estamos en una posición fe, es decir, la misma que hacemos para un abordaje rino sinusal, vamos a tener mayor eh, capacidad de trabajo para lo que es el ático. Hay una cuarta posición que es la que utiliza, eh, tuvimos la posibilidad de, de observar al doctor Marchioni, que es irse al lado contralateral del oído a operar y con una óptica angulada de 30 a 45 grados, observa lo que es el retrotímpano. Es decir, eh, uno tiene que, la verdad que tener bastante cancha, por así decirlo a esto, eh, porque es una imagen en espejo. La verdad que eh, eh, no es recomendable para eh, quien empieza. Bueno, ¿cuáles son los tips a tener en cuenta para iniciarse en, en la cirugía endoscópica? ¿Eh? Vamos a ir mencionando lo que es la, la preparación del conducto, los contenedores, el colegajo y la, y la irrigación. En primera instancia, fil, filtración del, infiltración perdón, del conducto aditivo y los contenedores. Eh, esto básicamente es para no frustrar en primera instancia. Es decir, eh, nosotros en primera instancia lo que se aconseja es anestesia endovenosa, tratar de evitar eh, anestésicos inhalados. Eh, el posicionamiento del paciente con respecto a la mesa quirúrgica tiene que ser la espalda a 30 grados eh, eh, con respecto a las piernas y una hiperextensión del cuello también de 30 grados, una pequeña hiperextensión. ¿Mm? La infiltración con, con biocaína al 2%, eh, nosotros colocamos adrenalina, colocamos los cotonoides como vimos en el video de abajo, y empezamos a preparar el conducto auditivo, ¿eh? la resección de los pelos, la extracción de la cera y demás. Los pelos parece una pavada, pero es muy importante porque uno va a evitar ensuciar la cámara y tener que limpiarla cada dos por tres. Entonces evita, vuelvo a repetir, la, la frustración. Con respecto a la colocación de endoscopio, y esto tiene que ver, por lo menos en mi criterio, evitar el temblor fino, como vemos el cirujano en el video de abajo. Es decir, tratar de hacer todo lo posible para evitar el temblor fino, que quizá por ahí en cirugía rinocinosal no, no nos importa tanto cuando se da, porque los espacios son mayores, pero en el oído es muy importante. Entonces, para evitar esto, hay dos elementos a mi criterio muy importantes. En primera instancia, el apoyo. El apoyo, el apoyo y esto está estudiado, tiene que ser en el conducto auditivo externo, ya sea en el trago, en el sector póstero superior al mismo, y por otro lado, en el codo del brazo eh, que sujeta el endoscopio. ¿eh? Eso evita muchísimo el, el, el temblor fino que podemos llegar a tener. Y por otro lado, no es menor, y llama la atención que no se ha estudiado, eh, por lo menos en lo que es respecto a la esfera otorrinoengológica, es la ingesta que el cirujano o, 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 o de privaciones de ciertas cuestiones que el cirujano tiene incluso el día previo de la cirugía. Está muy estudiado en eh, los neurocirujanos, lo que es la ingesta sobre todo de café, de algunos energizantes, modafilino y demás, eh, que pueden llegar a aumentar el temblor. Fíjense todos estos elementos que pueden alterar. Mm, eh, y si uno piensa, sobre todo cuando hizo la residencia y demás, y quizá eh, el café y algún energizante tomaba justamente después de guardias y demás. Entonces, tratar de evitar todas estas cuestiones, eh, por lo menos una noche antes de la, de la cirugía. 
colgajos amplios. ¿Por qué decimos colgajos amplios? Porque desde una primera etapa eh, iniciamos, uno acostumbrado a la visualización de la, del microscopio, eh, parece que uno hace colgajos amplios, pero no tanto. Entonces, cuando uno lo rebatía, eh, se da cuenta que le queda corto. ¿Y esto por qué es? Porque en la periferia de la visualización de, de la óptica, eh, puede, una, puede haber una, una, una falsa eh, interpretación de las mismas, es decir, están amplificados a ese nivel. Entonces nos puede parecer que un colgajo es muy grande o está correcto, pero en realidad es pequeño, las dimensiones son pequeñas. Entonces, consejo hacer colgajos amplios. La, ilumina, la iluminación y la irrigación. Ustedes saben que la punta del endoscopio eh, produce temperatura, ¿eh? Entonces es muy importante tratar de reducir justamente esto para evitar lesiones, tanto del facial, tanto de la ventana redonda, oval y demás. Entonces en primera instancia la, la, la idea era tener el porcentaje de, de, de iluminación, del, 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 del sistema de iluminación, en primera instancia en lo posible que sea LED, menor del 50%. Ahora bien, de, luego se reportaron algunos trabajos en los cuales se evaluaba la visualización entre tener una intensidad del 50%, del 30% y el 10%. La verdad es que no había diferencia, por lo menos no se encontró. Entonces no tiene lógica. La idea, el consejo ahora es mantener una intensidad de luz lo más baja posible en la cual nos permita trabajar con buena eh, imagen, con buena visualización. Con respecto a la irrigación hay que decir que no solamente disminuye la temperatura en el oído medio, ayuda a evitar el fenómeno de red out limpiando la sangre cuando nosotros estamos trabajando con una cámara de un chip y ayuda a limpiar la cavidad, no solo del oído medio, sino de la mastoides. Eh, acuérdense que la óptica permite eso, trabajar en un, en un medio líquido o semilíquido, fresar y, y hacer diferentes disecciones. Y por último, como consejo, tiempo, es decir, darse la posibilidad de tardar tallando un colgajo cuando iniciamos, darse la posibilidad de tardar cuando necesitamos acceder a, cierta, a ciertos lugares del oído con la óptica, eh, lleva su tiempo a adecuarse a la coordinación eh, entre la óptica y las manos, eso lleva tiempo, entonces no, no frustrarse de inmediato. Rápidamente vamos a, a mí me parece que el, la, la cirugía endoscópica tiene, eh, digamos, la, 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 las intervenciones más importantes que ofrece eh, es la resección de colestatoma, la resección de retracciones y, ¿por qué no?, las malformaciones de cadena circular en la cual uno puede eh, identificar eh, la alteración. Fíjense que este es un pequeño bolsillo pitimpánico en lo cual se observa una erosión de parte del cuerpo del yunque y eh, apófisis eh, descendente de, de la misma con erosión completa, ya van a ver, de eh, la superestructura del estrío. Entonces, resecamos, el colgajo lo tallamos con, con la punta de colorado, lo hacemos cuando pensamos que va a sangrar, hay movilidad del estrío. Esta es un, una, una visualización de 30 grados, fíjense la diferencia, esto es lo que decía, que con ópticas de 0 grados no vamos a ver eh, lo mismo que vemos con ópticas con angulación. Y por último, la... la la cutumplastia, la reposición de, del injerto, utilizamos mucho cartílago para esto, es decir, no diferencia con técnicas eh, microscópicas con respecto a esto, es lo mismo, eh, hay algunos detalles que hay que tener en cuenta. Si hablamos de principio tenemos que hablar de curva de aprendizaje y beneficio, esto es un, una imagen del doctor Potier que lamentablemente ya ha fallecido, en el cual se menciona que la curva de aprendizaje del endoscopio es más pronunciada que la curva del microscopio, es decir, se dificulta aprender, se dificulta eh, adquirir el conocimiento o, 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 o eh, digamos, la destreza adecuada para sentirse cómodo. ¿eh? Eso es real y sobre todo en aquellos cirujanos que no han tocado una óptica, no han hecho cirugía rino sinusal. ¿eh? Ahora bien, cuando uno lo compara con la curva de beneficio en términos de beneficios para el paciente, eh, llámese, volvemos a repetir, eh, posoperatorio, incisiones, eh, cicatrización, eh, tiempo de internación y demás, quizá puede ser muchísimo, muchísimo mayor la, eh, la curva de, eh, del endoscopio con respecto al microscopio. ¿Mm? 
Entonces, para terminar y como conclusión, eh, ya dándole paso al doctor Aaron, debemos decir que, en primera instancia, repetimos lo mismo, no es una pelea, eh, no es una cosa o la otra, son elementos, eh, el cual uno tiene que tener a disposición eh, el criterio, por lo menos de nosotros, es patología de oído medio, son, se van a cansar de escucharlo, patología de oído medio con endoscopio, patología de mastoide con microscopio. Eh, eh, y eso no, no, no quiere decir que eh, eh, terminemos con un elemento, es decir, podemos intercambiar, iniciar con uno y pasar con el otro o viceversa. ¿Mm? La óptica, el endoscopio, otorga un conocimiento anatómico exquisito. Eh, volvemos a repetir, eh, nos da la posibilidad incluso de, de descubrir variantes anatómicas que quizás no teníamos. Y no solamente para el cirujano, sino para eh, el médico en formación que está al lado, es decir, observa lo mismo que ve el cirujano. ¿Mm? Volvemos a decir lo mismo, la experiencia endoscópica nasal es muy útil para esta, para esta técnica. Y como consejos... En primera instancia, visitar la página oficial de, del Grupo Internacional de Trabajo de Cirugía Endoscópica de Oído. Pueden visitar nuestra página, eh, pueden ver videos, hay muchísimos videos eh, de, bueno, de nuestro canal, pero hay muchísimos de, videos de cirujanos muy buenos internacionales. Eh, y sobre todo, hacer cursos eh, de, de cirugía endoscópica de oído y visitar a los, a los miembros del Grupo Internacional de trabajo. Eh, me parece que es la, si tienen la posibilidad cuando pase toda esta, esta pandemia de viajar y observar eh, en vivo cuáles son las complicaciones, cuáles son los, 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 los hábitos quirúrgicos y demás. Espero que, le, que les haya gustado, les haya, les haya sido útil y bueno, estoy para cualquier pregunta que tengan. Si quieren, pueden escribir las preguntas en el chat, así se las releemos. Al doctor Prieu, ¿alguien tiene alguna duda, alguna pregunta? Bueno, vamos a pasar a hacer la encuesta... Bueno, vamos a hacer una rifa por una beca al Congreso de Mar del Plata si el COVID-19 nos deja Para poder participar necesitamos que contesten Perdón, ¿eh? Necesitamos que contesten la encuesta que hay que la dejaron en el chat. Bueno, es una beca para el Congreso Aniversario FASO, número 73. La idea es completar la encuesta, que está en el link en el chat, y les vamos a dejar una pregunta para que contesten. Les damos cinco minutos. La pregunta es, ¿cuál es el límite el posterior del protímpano según Marchioni y Taravici?
Bueno. Bueno, y la respuesta es el Jacobson. Genial. Después decimos al final el ganador. Bueno, muy bien, le vamos a pasar a dar la palabra a Melisa Bustamante. Meli, ¿estás ahí? Sí, aquí estoy. ¿Querés presentar a Aaron? Bueno, eh, yo soy Melisa Castillo Bustamante, eh, fui residente del Hospital Británico y médica visitante del Hospital de Clínicas. Actualmente estoy en Harvard Medical School y el día de hoy les quiero presentar al doctor Aaron Remy Schneider, que es mi, mi jefe acá en los Estados Unidos y es uno de los otólogos de UMass y también de Harvard Medical School. Um, jefe, it's a pleasure to, to share with you this space. <laughs> These are the Argentinian students as well, and there are many other people from many other countries from South America and Central America. So welcome, we would like also to thank you to um, uh, Club Torino Laringológico and also to the Argentinian Patagonian uh, Association. So, Welcome and hope you enjoyed this. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Melissa. Hola. <laughs> Let me see if I can share my screen. Yes, I think you have your, your option there. It's at the, at the bottom. This top there. There it goes. Let me know. Yeah. It's showing okay. in the uh, presenter view, okay? Yeah. Great. Okay, well, thank you very much, Melissa. Um, as uh, many of you uh, may not know, um, Melissa Castillo-Bustamante, uh, Dr. Bustamante has been in my lab for the past nearly year and has been a wonderful addition to our research team uh, and uh, has really been a fantastic ambassador to much of uh, South America. So I want to uh, thank her, first of all, for inviting me to present this talk with you today. Um, and uh, it's very nice to meet you all. Um, I'm going to speak to you tonight about uh, endoscopic approaches for tympanic membrane perforations, uh, a topic that I'm sure that you are somewhat familiar with, but I'll speak a little bit about our own uh, surgical practice uh, techniques that we use in the operating room as well as in the clinic uh, and go through some of our uh, research activities as they relate to tympanic membrane regeneration. Um, we have research support from a number of agencies including the Department of Defense and the uh, NIH and NIDCD as well as several additional foundations. So This is a picture of Boston. Uh, this is uh, on a beautiful spring day, as you can see um, right now in Boston. Uh, it is absolutely gorgeous outside. The trees are blooming. Um, it's very, very uh, pleasant. But as you know, there are severe restrictions on us about how much we can move uh, and where we can go because of the coronavirus. Uh, this has had a big, big impact on our ability to um, live normal lives and, uh, and see patients uh, in an elective fashion. Um, I've been in Boston for uh, almost 11 years and uh, have been a, a big fan of many of the things that happen in Boston, including the Boston Marathon. Um, as many of you uh, may know, the Boston Marathon is the oldest running marathon in the world, uh, and it happens at the beginning of April. Unfortunately, this year it was canceled due to the coronavirus. Um, it was the first, first time that that has happened. Um, the Back in 2013, um, that was a beautiful day in April when we were running the marathon, and unfortunately there was a tragedy at the finish line. 
there were uh, several improvised explosive devices that detonated and resulted in loss of life and uh, many injuries. The eardrum, it turns out, was one of the most commonly injured uh, parts of the body. Uh, and the, uh, these drawings that you see here were actually done by myself uh, on that day um, nearly seven years ago. And they document the many, many cases that we saw of patients with bilateral tympanic membrane perforations. Um, nearly every patient that was admitted to the hospital had a tympanic membrane perforation. Um, and uh, we had a, a very high burden of, uh, of disease. Perhaps we could ask if everyone could mute their microphone. Por favor, si pueden silenciar los micrófonos. Um, in uh, one year later, in 2014, we published a paper on the outcomes uh, from that experience. We had 62 tympanic membrane perforations and ended up doing 22 tympanoplasties. And this really um, uh, drove home the overall burden uh, as it was related to this event. Um, over the short term, we had a relatively good success rate with our tympanoplasty, 86% closure rate. But when we looked at our closure rate uh, four years later, uh, it had come down as about 65%. And so this really brought us to consider why we were doing so many revision surgeries and, and ways that we could uh, perhaps uh, improve upon tympanoplasty techniques and tympanoplasty grafting materials, as I'll talk about a little bit later in the talk. Um, and I, and I think uh, it demonstrates the importance of uh, the ear surgeon in any context where there is a blast-related injury. So as, as way of introduction, uh, I'll speak a little bit about the anatomy of the auditory pathway and the tympanic membrane, the physiology of normal and perforated eardrums. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about histology, given that we have an otopathology lab at the Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary. Uh, and that's a place where uh, Melissa and I do a lot of collaborative research. And then I'll talk about tympanoplasty techniques showing endoscopic and open approaches uh, and review some of our research. So as everyone knows, the tympanic membrane sits at the entrance to the auditory pathway. Sound comes down the ear canal and those sound pressure waves uh, are uh, converted from acoustical uh, stimulation or acoustical energy into mechanical energy. And the eardrum is what converts those acoustical waves into mechanical vibration, which are carried along the ossicular chain and make their way into the cochlea to stimulate the sensory cells. The organic membrane has several parts to it. It's important to keep in mind when we're uh, conducting an otologic exam pars tensa, this part uh, below the level of the uh, posterior and anterior malleolar ligaments, and above that is the pars flaccida. It has a tri-layer structure, including an epidermal epithelium, a middle strength layer composed of radial and circular collagen fibers, and a very thin mucosal epithelium. Um, and as such, this three-dimensional structure uh, is uh, incredibly effective at converting those uh, sound pressure waves into mechanical energy. And it also serves an important role as a barrier from the ear canal to the middle ear and limiting infection. The mechanics of the normal eardrum are important to understand. The way that the ear eardrum primarily works um, is through uh, something called the aspect ratio. So the large size of the intact eardrum is much larger than the small size of the stapes footplate. And this impedance matching, meaning that the sound pressure waves coming in and impacting the eardrum ultimately still result in vibrations of the inner ear fluid, is performed primarily because of that aspect ratio and also because the eardrum provides a complete barrier to the middle ear. And so as such, there is a pressure differential between the sound pressure in the ear canal and the sound pressure within the middle ear, which drives the middle ear ossicular system. When you have a perforation in the eardrum, 
that um, pressure difference across the tympanic membrane is much less, and that results in significant hearing losses at low and mid frequencies. Because the tympanic membrane is very thin, it also can be perforated. It's very highly subject to damage, and particularly when there are rapid changes in barometric pressure or in um, uh, 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 exterior pressure within the environment, such as during a blast pressure wave or even with ascent and descent on an airplane, you can develop a perforated tympanic membrane. <clears throat> How else can this occur? Well, blast injuries, as we discussed, traumatic injuries. We often see patients with Q-tips that they put in their ear can result in a perforated drum. Chronic infections, very common cause of perforated tympanic membranes due to infection within the middle ear space and poor eustachian tube function. And as a consequence of chronic ear infections, patients may go on to develop uh, cholesteatoma. Patients with tympanic membrane perforations uh, almost always have hearing loss, but can also have pain, drainage, intermittent dizziness, and they have a need to keep their ear dry through water precautions. This is a low-powered photomicrograph. This is a histologic slide of a human temporal bone showing this area, which is the external auditory canal. As you come down the external auditory canal, we find the tympanic membrane. And here is the thin anterior tympanic membrane. You get a sense that it really is only about 75 microns thick. Posteriorly, though, this is a specimen that has a tympanic membrane perforation. Here you can see the manubrium of the malleus. Here you can see the distal lenticular process of the incus, and here you can say an outline of the stapy superstructure. Here is the foot plate, here is the vestibule, and here is the cochlea. You can see the carotid artery, the eustachian tube, and the facial nerve. So we really have all of our anatomy right here within the middle ear and the ear canal. If we look at a higher magnification, at the tympanic membrane, at the level of the perforation, we can make several important observations. The first is that the ep squamous epithelium in a tympanic membrane perforation typically migrates around the edge of the perforation and can extend onto the undersurface of the drum. This is incredibly important to know because it justifies the rimming of a perforation that we do when we perform tympanoplasty. And that is because we want to remove this inner epithelium so as to prevent a cholesteatoma. So what about tympanoplasty techniques? If you were to read four textbooks on ear surgery, you would probably find four different methods of tympanoplasty. And that is because there are many, many different ways to fix the eardrum and many ways that can do this with moderate efficacy. Um, why do we uh, repair the eardrum in different ways? Well, because we're trained by different folks. Uh, those of us who are in training programs that have uh, attending surgeons that fix the eardrum in one particular way will likely be the ones to carry on that technique. But there are also patient factors that influence our decision to perform tympanoplasty in one versus another fashion. Tympanoplasty outcomes can certainly vary dependent upon these factors, but also based on postoperative care. And postoperative care can vary by the surgical technique utilized. Endoscopic ear surgery, endoscopic ear surgery, te surgical techniques, we're going to talk a lot about today. This is an important book by uh, Dr. Prezuti and Dr. Marchioni. I saw they were the subject of one of your last uh, uh, questions. Um, really, some of the foremost thought leaders uh, on endoscopic ear surgery um, and uh, their uh, conference, the Endoscopic Ear Surgery World Conference, which was held in Boston uh, just last year. Um, featured a lot of discussion about tympanoplasty techniques. <clears throat> so again, we have another low-powered photomicrograph of the human temporal bone, including the external auditory canal here, the funnel or conical-shaped tympanic membrane, which you can see here, manubrium of the malleus, the middle ear space, here is the basal turn of the cochlea, facial nerve, um, 
<clears throat> and when we look at this tympanic membrane that has been perforated in this position, we have one indication for tympanoplasty. So anterior perforations present a particular problem for the ear surgeon, and that is because traditional methods to repair an anterior perforation can be unsuccessful if used in this location. When we think about an underlay graft, the red that's bolded here is our graft material. We'll call it temporalis fascia because that's a very commonly used material. If we go from an anterior perforation and we lay a underlay fascia graft, one of the problems that will likely occur is that this graft may fail because the anterior edge will pull away from the anterior tympanic annulus. This is the um, most common area for failure for an underlay technique in an anterior perforation. There are a number of modifications that can be used, including the medial onlay technique and a pull tab pull through technique. I will not get into specific of those today, but I think the point I want to make is that regardless of the type of um, approach, microscopic or endoscopic that you use, an underlay graft is, has a higher chance of failure with a anterior perforation. If you do an onlay technique where we are putting the fascia graft on top of the tympanic membrane after removing all of the squamous epithelium, we frequently will have a problem of what's called blunting. This anterior tympanomiatal angle will scar and this results in very poor function of the tympanic membrane and even though you may close the perforation, you will likely have a poor hearing outcome. <clears throat> when we look otopathologically at other specimens that had this type of a procedure done, you can see this severe scarring, this severe blunting. Here's the manubrium, no longer that nice thin tympanic membrane. We have a massive amount of scar tissue in this tympanic membrane really does not vibrate well and has a poor functional effect. So for anterior perforations, the preferred technique that I learned from my mentor, uh, uh, Dr. Michael McKenna at the Mass Eye and Ear, and this was a technique that originated at the House Ear Clinic by Daryl Brackman, is to use a total drum replacement technique. This is a microscopic surgical technique, and it is incredibly successful for treatment of anterior perforations and subtotal perforations. The way that this works is that we remove any remaining tympanic membrane and, and we place a, a temporalis fascia graft lined by skin grafts uh, uh, during the procedure. This is a view down the external auditory canal. Here is the completely denuded manubrium of the malleus a canal plasty has been performed, and we place the fascia graft beneath the manubrium of the malleus and onto the anterior tympanic wall. We then harvest a skin graft from the inside of the patient's arm and place this on uh, antibiotic impregnated uh, silk gauze that is then cut into small squares. We can use a dermatome like this or a straight razor blade to harvest the skin graft. These red patches identify the skin grafts which are placed most importantly to be placed anterior within the anterior tympanomiatal angle. And then we place what's called a rosebud dressing in order to pack and maintain the shape of the tympanic membrane over the healing period, which is typically about two weeks. So here again, here is the fascia graft placed in position, the skin grafts, which go on top to help the skin, the ear canal and the drum epithelialize and a rosebud pack that then helps to maintain the conical shape of the eardrum. This is a surgical photo from one of my cases. You can see here in this left ear, this is the manubrium of the malleus coming down. The, the fascia graft has been placed. This is the anterior edge. You can see that the entire eardrum has been replaced with the fascia graft. We then place the skin grafts on silk gauze 
serially in order to cover that anterior angle and the remainder of the drum. And then we place the silk strips down into and all circumferentially to um, create our rosebud dressing. We then place the cotton inside that is soaked in antibiotic solution. And this permits us to maintain that nice anterior angle for the healing tympanic membrane. Here is the uh, re resulting rosebud pack that stays in place for two weeks uh, and then is removed transmeatally in clinic. Just again to demonstrate, rosebud packing goes in after the fascia graft and skin grafts are placed, silk strips and cottonoid. We looked at the mechanics of a reconstructed eardrum. So this is a photograph of a patient who underwent a total drum reconstruction using this technique. So we can maintain that nice conical appearance. The patient has an aerated middle ear. Typically, the hearing is quite good at the low and mid frequencies. This is an example case a patient that had a low frequency hearing loss, we did the repair and we closed the ear bone gap in those low and mid frequencies. We have found though that high frequency hearing is not particularly well served after this type of a procedure and that the structure of the tympanic membrane of the reconstructed drum plays a role in the lack of high frequency response. And so this really is a technique that should only be utilized for patients with total perforations or large anterior perforations. Now, endoscopic ear surgery has permitted us to do a better job with visualizing the middle ear space. And there are some advantages towards using an endoscope, although the endoscope should in no way replace our use of the microscope for ear surgery. We get a wide field view, the light is at the tip of the instruments, and we can use an angled scope to look around corners, and in many cases that is less invasive. But it does not necessarily mean that it is more successful at fixing a perforation. The principles of tympanoplasty are the same, and so we have to abide by those same principles whether we're using an endoscope or a microscope. This is a picture of me in the operating room with my mentor, Dr. Michael McKenna, um, showing that uh, even he is using the endoscope now after a career of 35 years doing microscopic surgery. So um, uh, he, uh, even he was an enthusiast, and um, although we were using both the microscope and the endoscope um, towards the end of his clinical years, uh, we were able to convince him of the merits of this technique. And I think that a photograph like this really says it all. This is the same ear visualized through the ear canal with a microscope and again with an endoscope. You just see so much better. So to quickly go through some basic anatomy, this is a right ear with a tympanomedial flap that has been elevated. And we can see some relevant anatomy here, including the long process of the incus, the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, the stapes superstructure, the incutostapedial joint, the stapedial tendon, the cochleiform process seen with the endoscope, the round window and the round window tegmen that is removed during cochlear implant surgery, the cochlear promontory, and the sinus tympani, which is so easy to visualize with an endoscope while very hard to see with a microscope. The posterior and the anterior pillar of the round window and the funiculus, which connects to the hypotympanum. In this case, the patient has otosclerosis and the surgery was a stapedectomy. So let's go through a few cases of endoscopic ear surgery to illustrate our, <clears throat> um, uh, our techniques. So this is the first case, which is a 36-year-old gentleman, um, two years uh, with a history of a right tympanic membrane perforation that was secondary to barotrauma. And uh, following the perforation, he had oral fullness, intermittent drainage, conductive hearing loss, but really had no symptoms of childhood or chronic ear infections or eustachian tube dysfunction. 
When we examined him, we found an inferior 30% tympanic membrane perforation and made the decision in the office, given his audiogram and his symptoms, that we would take him to the operating room for a transcanal endoscopic type 1 tympanoplasty using perichondrium. <clears throat> Here is a video of our procedure, and this begins with an evaluation first of the perforated tympanic membrane. Now we have made an incision within the ear canal and are raising a tympanomeatal flap. One of the key uh, difficulties in endoscopic ear surgery is hemostasis. <clears throat> and so I, I use uh, adrenaline soaked cottonoids in order to help to maintain good hemostasis and good visualization. I use those very liberally. Um, and in this case, we have elevated our tympanomeatal flap. Here is a piece of perichondrium, which we will then manipulate using a Rosen needle in an underlay fashion. This is a inferior perforation, extends slightly anterior, but even in this case, this is a very good candidate for an endoscopic approach. Um, we pack the ear with absorbable gel foam material, and I have to say this is the most important part of the case. You have to make sure in an underlay that you are compressing that graft all the way up against the medial surface of the drum in order to get good approximation if you want to uh, ensure that the graft heals. The perforation can be seen here. <clears throat> We're elevating our graft and uh, slightly herniating it through in order to tuck it into the right position. Um, I am very liberal with my gel foam and also utilize skin grafts very routinely. It's a nice double layer repair. Skin graft goes just on top and that will allow a good seal and adherence between that fascia graft or the perichondrial graft and the split thickness skin graft. I'm now packing the ear canal with gel foam in order to maintain it, and then we'll put an antibiotic solution or antibiotic ointment within the ear canal afterwards. This is the patient's prior uh, to surgery preoperative audiogram showing a right-sided low frequency conductive hearing loss. Keep in mind, we kept the native drum intact in this case, and after closure of the perforation, type A tympanogram, and we have complete closure of the ear bone gap, and we also have good high frequency hearing outcome, and that is because <clears throat> we did not remove the remainder of the drum, and the uh, remaining circular and radial fibers of the tympanic membrane permit that high frequency hearing. A couple of notes about positioning in the operating room with an endoscope. Put the monitor at eye level directly in front of you so that you don't have to turn your neck. It's very uncomfortable to have to do that. Uh, this is a setup in the operating room where we have our defog solution um, and we use a uh, hook-like retractor in order to almost do what's called a terabici stitch where you open the ear up, uh, but we do that not with a stitch but with a hook retractor. This is a picture of one of my first endoscopic ear cases. And I take, I show this picture to point out a few things. When you're first starting out, you want to start <clears throat> with an ear that's relatively easy for you. So as a right-handed surgeon, a left ear is easier because you're holding the scope in a more natural position. <clears throat> Secondly, I have a microscope in the room just in case I need to convert and use the microscope. That's very important to have and not to just only have the endoscope available in case you need it. One thing I will note is that see how my head is turned and I'm looking off to the side. This has poor screen position. The screen should be moved over directly in front of the surgeon, even if it means moving your scrub to the side. And so now this is my typical setup. This is me sitting down very comfortable Screen is at eye level. My scrub is right next to me, um, and we're operating almost in unison together. He can see everything on the screen, so he knows exactly what it is that I need as my next instrument. Now, when we're beginning endoscopic ear surgery, uh, you really want to start with just basics of inspection. 
do the case with the microscope and bring the endoscope in just to look around and to do surveillance. The first procedure that you should do is really to use it for a myringotomy and tube placement um, and definitely do that before moringoplasty. Surgery on the eardrum that involves raising a tympanomietal flap is particularly challenging for a novice endoscopic ear surgeon because you're dealing a lot with bleeding and you're trying to visualize uh, and you only have one hand. So moringoplasty is a challenging case. So is tympanoplasty and ossicular chain reconstruction. Management of cholesteatoma is typically the most challenging endoscopic case, although the endoscope is most suited for these types of procedures. Now I'll show another case with you. This is a case of a 51-year-old gentleman. He had right-sided chronic eustachian tube dysfunction and an associated conductive hearing loss. He also had intermittent ear infections as a child with requiring tube placement two to three times, but had not had any recent ear surgery or pain. He had a large posterior retraction pocket with a dense adhesion of the drum to the incus, and the CT scan showed no other concerning inner ear or middle ear anomalies. So the plan was to take him to the operating room for a transcanal endoscopic ossiculoplasty and a repair of his eardrum with a conchal cartilage graft. So this is a preoperative photo of this patient with a retraction pocket here and contact between the long process of the incus and the stapes by the drum. This is a Moringo incudo stapedio pexi. So we have injected our uh, epinephrine and then begun elevating the flap. Here we can see the corded tympani nerve, and we can see I'm using again the cotton balls in order to maintain hemostasis, and using a suction to help with the dissection, I can elevate the drum off of the corded tympani nerve and begin to see the middle ear mucosa where this is retracted down into the hypotympanum. I'm using a cup forceps in order to draw that up. And you can see here the long process of the incus and the stapes superstructure where the drum is densely adherent. It has eroded the lenticular process of the incus, the long process of the incus here, and has resulted in the conductive hearing loss. As I continue this dissection, very gently lifting the drum off of the long process of the incus using a cup forceps in order to do that final move. And you can see there we've now released this. We can mobilize the corda tympani nerve and we want to visualize the remainder of ossicular chain, make sure everything is intact. Use of a curette for the scutum is a really best practice in this area, allows you to be able to see and it can be done without powered instrumentation, which smokes and requires irrigation and suctioning. So curetting the scutum as you would for a stapedectomy. And then here we can see the long process of the incus and the stapes. <clears throat> and subsequent to this, we repair this defective incutostapedial joint with otomimics bone cement. So we have a bone cement that we can use in order to firm up this attachment and improve the overall sound conduction between the ossicles. We have harvested a piece of tragal cartilage, as you can see here, to repair that deep posterior retraction and prevent a recurrent incudo moringostapediopexy, uh, and then ultimately lower our tympanomiatal flap uh, and place our cell phone back. It results in uh, uh, closure of the drum and an improvement in the hearing. You can see here we have the gel foam packing. So another case, a pediatric case, I wanted to share with you, um, particularly because this is a case uh, of a, a young boy who had um, a cholesteatoma uh, demonstrated on CT, and I'll show you several CT scan slices here, um, including <clears throat> these axial cut temporal bone CT sequences. And what you can see is that here at the level of the stapes, we have a soft tissue mass. 
And if this was the only soft tissue mass that we saw, this would be a great endoscopic only case. But as we go up our CT scan, we can see actually another soft tissue rounded opacity within the mastoid that would not be accessible through an endoscopic approach. So this additional second mastoid uh, uh, opacity raised concern for disseminated cholesteatoma given the attic defect, the soft tissue around the stapes, which you can see here. And here you can see this child has a tympanostomy tube in place. And as we go back, we can see in the depths of the mastoid beyond the antrum is another soft tissue mass that ultimately turned out to be cholesteatoma. So when we address this case, we have to be thinking differently. This is a case that's going to require some drilling. This is a case that's going to require a microscopic approach. So the initial procedure was to remove the mastoid cholesteatoma and perform a canal wall up tympanomastoidectomy. And at the time we found an eroded incus and a snapped head of the malleus. Uh, we had intact and mobile stapes, but we did not perform an osseculoplasty given the need for a second look operation that was scheduled for nine months later. And that uh, is the case that I will show you today. This is a planned transcanal endoscopic ear surgery evaluation for residual cholesteatoma in an osseculoplasty. Osseculoplasty is a great case to do with an endoscope because you can see so clearly uh, um, where the uh, disease is, uh, uh, if there is any uh, remaining disease after a first procedure, uh, and because you can see your prosthesis sitting onto the stapes incredibly well. So here we're lifting a tympanomiato flap again using this uh, cottonoid liberally with uh, adrenaline uh, in order to limit uh, the bleeding. You can see we're raising our tympanomiato flap. We've already had an adicotomy performed at the time of the first procedure. Reconstructed with cartilage is a very nice reconstruction that held up well. And now we are dissecting off of the stapes the, uh, the cartilage graft in order to fully evaluate our middle ear space. Here is the stapes superstructure, stapedial tendon, pyramidal process, facial nerve. And now with an angled endoscope, we can look up into the attic, the epitympanum, no evidence of any cholesteatoma, nothing within the mesotympanum or anterior to the stapes superstructure. Our osseculoplasty sets have a sizing system that we use in order to determine the appropriate height of the partial ossicular replacement prosthesis, which we then choose. This is made out of titanium and has malleable tongs or tines that will ultimately sit down onto the stapes superstructure. And we get a beautiful view of this with the endoscope, very gently positioning this right on top of the stapes superstructure, ensuring those tines are right around. Here's the stapedial tendon. This will provide a little more distance, a bigger columella between the stapes and the cartilage graft. You place a additional cartilage graft to reinforce this um, prior to closing. Uh, and uh, I think this case nicely demonstrates how one can uh, perform an osseculoplasty and second look operation in a very minimally invasive fashion with the endoscope. Here's the cartilage, a tragal cartilage graft sitting on top of the prosthesis. You want to make sure that this is not buckled underneath any of the, the bone, otherwise there will be inferior um, uh, vibration from the drum to the prosthesis. And now we replace this graft with our drum elevator <clears throat> and then pack the ear with gel foam and antibiotic Appointment. When we look at the patient's uh, hearing, this was prior to the uh, uh, first procedure. Uh, he's had an improvement uh, in his low and mid frequency conductive hearing on the right, almost close to the left. Given how significant of disease he had, this is a very uh, satisfying outcome. Now, this is um, another case I wanted to share with you about a closed-type cholesteatoma. Um, this is a case 
that can be very um, uh, easily done using an endoscope. Uh, and this is in a, a relatively small child. Uh, the patient was two years old and had a left uh, white middle ear mass in the anterior superior quadrant and very good hearing. Uh, these are a couple of cuts from his CT scan showing a small white mass there on the left side. You can see this is a very small pediatric patient. But despite the fact that the patient is quite small, keep in mind that the ear canal in young children is still relatively wide. You can do endoscopic ear surgery in young children. Their ear canal is short, but it's wide. Here's a view of his tympanic membrane. He was referred to me by an outside otolaryngologist who placed a tube in his ear. And at the time the tube was placed, saw the white mass. So here we are lifting the tympanomeatal flap um, using those uh, adrenaline-soaked cottonoids in order to maintain good hemostasis. And we're elevating this flap all the way down to the level of the annulus. You really want to be careful when you get to the fibrous annulus not to perforate the drum. We've got a very good view with the endoscope, and so we want to maintain that. You can see here's the fibrous annulus there, and here is the corda tympani nerve and the long process of the incus. So now we're going to manipulate the flap anteriorly and reflect it superiorly. Here's the long process of the incus, stapes tendon, promontory of the cochlea, and the cohorta tympani nerve, which did not have to be moved. So we now elevate the tympanic membrane using a sickle knife from the annulus and up and over the lateral process of the malleus to be able to get to that anterior superior quadrant. And now we can see very clearly the malleus, posterior malleolar ligament, which we will lyse right here. And then dissect further with a joint knife from the manubrium of the malleus, the tympanic membrane. And you can elevate this all the way anteriorly until we get to our congenital cholesteatoma, which sits just anterior to the malleus. Further dissection using a small joint knife, you have to be very careful. His hearing was perfect before the surgery. We want to make sure that it is after the fact. So we can open up this small pocket right here. Do not remove the drum from the umbo if possible. And if you can do this and actually remove this congenital cholesteatoma, it comes out with a suction right out. And then we can inspect the area, make sure there was no additional cholesteatoma, reflect the tympanomeatal flap, uh, and this child should go on to have no further issues uh, whatsoever. So one question that we're asked is, what about tympanic membrane repair in the office, perhaps in an awake patient? Is this something that we're thinking about? So this is a typical setup with a, uh, you know, an uh, uh, exam table. This is an elderly patient of mine who had a tympanic membrane perforation and we're looking underneath the microscope. But we have in recent days been performing endoscopic tympanoplasty in awake patients in the clinic. We have a screen, we have all the equipment that one needs. And the patients who wouldn't typically be candidates can actually very easily have the procedure done in clinic without undergoing general anesthesia. It also is much faster for them. Here this patient is having, you can see a tympanic membrane perforation on the screen um, and uh, my uh, suction manipulating this as we perform the tympanoplasty. This was a patient on Coumadin, did not need to stop her blood thinning medication. We're able to complete the procedure there. Now what challenges exist with this technique? Well, if we use a traditional tympanoplasty approach, we have to elevate a flap. That takes a long time. That's very challenging. We have to deal with ear canal bleeding, which is a pain in the operating room when we have low blood pressure. In the clinic, patients may be moving. What about tissue graft harvest? That can be a big challenge too. Are you going to make a separate incision? And do we have to pack the middle ear that could incite a vestibular or caloric response? So we have been thinking a lot about this and been utilizing a new type of graft technique. We call this the winged graft for tympanic membrane repair. 
You can use any material for this, but we have chosen to use a, a off the shelf material that we have available to us uh, derived from porcine small intestinal submucosa. If you take a biopsy punch and you create two discs and then you incise the discs, not all the way, leaving a small bridge in the middle, you can interdigitate these discs in order to create a winged graft such as this. And that winged graft can then be used to repair a tympanic membrane without lifting a tympanomiatal flap. These are the steps you can see of perforation. We measure the size of the perforation and accordingly utilize a biopsy punch that would fit. So the graft needs to be slightly larger than the perforation. And we then deploy the graft with the medial two wings underneath the tympanic membrane and the lateral two wings on top of it in a sandwich style approach. We have done this now in 20 patients in our clinic and have been very excited about the results. So to review how we create the graft, we take two, a biopsy punch with two discs of a graft material. We then make cuts in them in order to slide them into each other. You have to make two cuts on both sides. This interdigitation gives you a winged graft that can then uh, be deployed in a, a patient through the perforation, a transperforation fa fashion. The graft placement, after you identify, you rim the perforation. Remember, you have to get that squamous debris out, so you have to numb the surface of the eardrum prior to doing this. Place the graft, deploy the medial wings. And then ultimately, once the medial wings are beneath the remnant tympanic membrane, you have sealed the perforation and you do not need middle ear packing. Here is a case of a wake patient in the clinic. We rim the perforation. The patient has to be willing to undergo this. So you need to numb their ear canal first with viscous lidocaine. And then we can deploy our graft, as you see here in order to patch the perforation use of suction. The endoscope enables this. Packing goes into the ear canal. This entire procedure takes about 10 to 15 minutes. Patients go home from the clinic after being in your office for no more than an hour. What is the outcome? This is that patient, this patient we just saw. Here is the tympanic membrane perforation that she presented with. Here is her tympanic membrane after the tympanoplasty. Closed her air bone gap. She's a very, very happy patient. So what about other types of perforations? Here is another perforation, smaller one with a small mucosalized rim. This is a patient who is on Coumadin. You can see it bleeds a lot more, but we rim the perforation while the patient is awake in the clinic. We remove these additional components, and then here is our graft, larger than the perforation. We deploy the graft on both sides. This material allows for you to manipulate it to create this button-type repair, and you can see here, we check, make sure all aspects of the medial flanges are deployed, and here is our deployed graft. We pack the ear canal again with antibiotic-soaked gel foam, and an antibiotic ointment. We usually release a small amount of additional blood. The plasma helps a lot to help promote the healing. Patients ultimately do quite well. And here is an additional case, similar thing. You'll see over and over again, what we're doing here is rimming the small perforation, removing any extra mucosa, as you can see here, deploying a graft, you can see here, this graft is slightly larger than the perforation, but that's okay. Make sure that all edges are deployed. This patient has a large bony overhang, but that doesn't bother us. We're able to do it with an endoscope. The patient tolerates it. And in the end, we put in our packing. Again, here, this is a uh, Preoperatively and postoperatively, you can see here patient has a repair membrane perforation. This again, one additional uh, uh, case, 
Again, similar type of an approach right through the ear canal. This is a patient also on Coumadin. We're checking to make sure that the, the drum is intact or that the repair is solid. And what you can see here again in our pre and post preoperative photo, postoperative photo, very nice closure, robust vascular ingrowth um, and uh, closed air bone gap. Um, we have attempted this on larger perforations. This is a patient that had a large anterior perforation rimmed and we were able to get this to heal. This is the patient after the fact, closure of her tympanic membrane perforation. We published a small case series on this technique, uh, showing a variety of etiologies of perforation, including traumatic and otitis media. Most important though, the age. These are older patients. These are patients who would not have otherwise come to the operating room and uh, elected to undergo an in-office repair. So it shows that patients who may otherwise age out of traditional OR approaches may be good candidates in the clinic. This is a citation for our paper. We had a mean procedure length of about 25 minutes. These were the first five cases. Nowadays, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes. No complications, um, significant improvement of the ear bone gap and a tympanometry change from type B to type A. Um, I know that I'm at uh, 52 minutes, so I don't want to take more time than I'm allotted. Um, I have a couple of slides about our research work, but I want to uh, obviously check with the moderator to see whether I should continue or whether we should stop for questions. I think you can continue, having. Don't worry. Okay, so I'll do just a couple of uh, slides about our current research in the lab. We uh, have partnered with the School of Engineering at Harvard in order to try and advance the graft materials that we use. We know that um, the tympanic membrane has an important structure with circular and radial fibers, and we would like to be able to replicate that in our grafts. Our ultimate goal is to improve upon the healing and hearing outcomes after tympanoplasty without the need for a graft harvest. How do we do this? We use a 3D printer. These are my collaborators. Nicole Black is a PhD student in my lab and Jennifer Lewis is a world-renowned 3D printing expert. And what we asked them to do was to take the fibrous structure of the tympanic membrane and to print it. And in pretty rapid succession, they did back in 2016. We have come a long way since then, and we now have graphs that look much more like this, uh, with a novel polymer that has directionally dependent mechanical properties, good healing properties, um, and we have begun using these graphs in our animal model. We have an animal model of a chinchilla. Chinchillas have tympanic membranes that are close to the human size. We can make a chronic tympanic membrane perforation, and then we can repair it using an underlay approach uh, and an endoscope. So this is a rimming of the perforation, which happens at the beginning of the procedure of the tympanoplasty. Then we approach the middle ear through the bulla in order to place our grafts. We enter through the bulla and we can see the medial aspect of the drum, the round window, the manubrium of the malleus, and here you can see gel foam packing on the medial surface of the drum and our graft, which is placed uh, on the medial surface as an underlay. Um, we have then uh, looked at these animals. Uh, this is a view through the tympanic, uh, through the uh, ear canal, and you can see there is the graft sitting in good position in an underlay fashion. We pack the ear canal uh, thereafter. We uh, utilize our biomimetic tympanic membrane graft that has radial and circular fibers in order to look at the directionally dependent properties. Uh, and we compare them to uh, off-the-shelf materials like biodesign as well as uh, temporalis fascia, which is most commonly used. And what we have found is that to date, 80% of our 3D printed grafts have healed. Um, the number uh, of grafts that have healed uh, with biodesign and fascia have been less. Um, a large systematic review uh, was recently performed and found that on average, repair uh, success rates for tympanic membrane perforations for type 1 tympanoplasties are typically around 70, 75 to 80%. So we're right in line with some of those, some of those numbers. Histologically, we can then take those animals, we can decalcify their skulls and stain them with H&E. This is a cross-section through the ear canal. This is the tympanic membrane, and we can see very nicely a thin 
tympanic membrane with a graft that is in the process of resorbing, these animals have better high frequency hearing after this procedure. When we look at control materials, we see an incredibly thickened tympanic membrane. So if you compare this to our material, this biodesign or the submucosa of a, a, a porcine small intestinal submucosa remains relatively thick out to three months and relatively disorganized. We also know that there is no ototoxic effect. When we look at our grafted tympanic membrane um, specimens, we can also analyze the cochlear histology. In this case, we're looking now at the organ of cordy. We can count the outer hair cells, which are all present, inner hair cells present, and a normal structure, including the tectoral membrane, Reisner's membrane, the basilar membrane, and the osseous spiral lamina. So with that, I want to say thank you, um, you know, first and foremost to Melissa for the kind invitation to give this presentation to you all and to the rest of my research team and lab mentors that I have had uh, through Mass Ioneer over the years uh, and to, um, uh, to you all for uh, being willing to listen uh, to this talk. And with that, I'll take any questions. Si hay alguna pregunta, eh, la pueden realizar. I'm going to translate the, um, just the, the question. One is, um, what do you use for, for anesthesia in the procedure? During the, in the in-office procedure, I take it? Yeah, yeah, in-office procedures. So I use two types of anesthesia. The first is a cotton ball with viscous 4% lidocaine. It's typically used, uh, you know, in the upper aerial digestive tract or um, uh, in the mouth. But if you soak a cotton ball in that viscous lidocaine and you place it into the ear canal and you let it sit for 10 to 15 minutes, it will begin to anesthetize the ear canal. You need to get it down onto the surface of the eardrum so it also anesthetizes the eardrum. I then will take that out after 10 to 15 minutes and perform one injection with lidocaine, 1%, with epinephrine in the posterior superior ear canal and very slowly inject that and that will anesthetize and provide good hemostasis for the entire ear canal. And that is typically all that is needed to perform these procedures. You must be very careful not to touch the middle ear mucosa because that is not anesthetized. It only anesthetizes the lateral surface of the drum and the ear canal. Great. Una otra pregunta? Bueno, no. Um I received like some some comments, some good comments uh, for this talk, Hepe, and the people from Club Otorrinolaryngológico and also from um, the association from Patagonia. They are just very grateful for this opportunity. I think it's a a nice, a very nice talk. And well, I, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, I think she's going to to talk now. Uh, La doctora Rodríguez me dijeron que, que quería decir algo. Sí, muchas gracias, muchas Melissa. Gracias. Quería agradecer eh, por parte de la Comisión Directiva del Club Otorrino Laringológico, de todos nosotros y de la Comisión también de la Patagonia, a su presidente, al, al doctor Raúl Alvarenga. También quiero agradecer al doctor Priu y, por supuesto, a vos y al doc doctor Aarón por esta presentación, eh, por ser tan generosos con todos nosotros aquí en Argentina y también esperemos que podamos repetir otro encuentro como este y que esté plagado de todos nuestros colegas a lo largo y a lo ancho no solo de nuestro país sino del resto de América que también han participado. Te pido que les transmitas a él nuestro agradecimiento y realmente ha sido muy generoso con todo lo que nos ha brindado. También en otro orden de cosas, y como el club viene haciendo siempre y sosteniendo la educación de aquellos que se están formando, eh, la beca para el Congreso de Mar del Plata es para el doctor Leonardo Colorado, que ha respondido, ha 
eh, respondido no solamente la encuesta, sino la pregunta hecha por la doctora Saldaña en tiempo récord. Así que les agradecemos a todos ustedes también la contestación de la encuesta porque es fundamental para que el club siga teniendo estos encuentros de excelencia desde hace tantísimos años. Y aprovecho la oportunidad que está nuestro presidente para que nos salude y finalice eh, este encuentro. Mil, mil gracias a todos. Bueno, gracias Mariela por darme el pase. Eh, thank you very much, doctor. Excellent presentation. Eh, I, I, uh, I have an Indian English. <ríe> bueno, eh, chicos, les agradezco mucho haber venido, eh, haber participado en esta, en, este, en esta reunión. La verdad que estuve pispeando las respuestas, un poquitito lo que, lo que fue mirando Mariel en realidad, y hay muchas cosas interesantes que surgen. Así que a partir de esto vamos a trabajar para poder acercar más los contenidos que la gente quiere y que le interesa. Eh, nuevamente, muchas gracias. Seguimos con todo para todos. Y les recuerdo que el club es muy participativo. Tené, todos los que tengan ganas de participar y colaborar son bienvenidos. Eh, Hacemos el cierre. ¿Alguien más va a hablar? No. Muchísimas gracias. No, damos, bueno, damos por finalizada entonces la sesión y hasta la próxima. Hasta luego. Chao. Adiós. Adiós. Chao. Gracias.